This is the Modern Architect radio show and podcast. The Modern Architect features one-on-one interviews with renowned and cutting-edge architects, influencers, and sustainability leaders. Our show informs and illuminates the transformation that architecture brings to our cities, communities, and lives. And now, introducing the host of The Modern Architect, Tom Dioro. Thank you. Today, we are joined by Francisco G. Bolido, architect and principal of FGP Atelier. Francisco is a renowned architect noted for his expressive yet rational design approach. You can find them on the web at fgp-atelier.com. Today's episode is made possible by Modeler, the rapidly growing community for AEC professionals to find and share design inspiration. Created and maintained by architects, join hundreds of thousands of other AEC professionals who are part of the Modeler community. Visit modeler.com and follow Modeler on your favorite social media channels for regular design inspiration. Francisco, we're honored and excited to have you on the show today. Thank you very much for being here. Inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Francisco, can you share with us, I know you have uh, in our previous conversation, but for your audience today, what was your early inspirations in architecture and design? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the, the inspiration really came from my early years in uh, living in the northeastern part of the, of the country in Mexico. Uh, my father had a, 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 a large ranch right by the mountains, uh, and uh, there was always uh, the need of building things, right? Um, it was more industrial architecture, but I, I really like industrial architecture, by the way. And and I was enjoying the process of really being involved in construction. You know, it was not so much about design. It was really more about construction. And that actually was a big thing for me. The the second moment that was actually critical, I, I went to uh, Italy I'm on a trip when I was 19 years old and to Spain and to France. And, uh, and in Italy, I was... Uh, of course, I had studied a lot of these buildings, uh, classical buildings, especially from the Renaissance times during architecture school in, in, in architectural history. But being there, it was really impactful, very, very impactful about, you know, how precise they were, uh, the, mag- the scale of the idea and the scale of the buildings too. And then I remember clearly that I, I went to... Uh, Paris, and and when I saw the the George Pompidou building by Renzo Piano and Richard Rogers, that completely changed my perception of architecture, and and I decided that this is what I wanted to do. And it was interesting because that building in particular has a strong connection with my beginnings, right? With industrial buildings, it's a building that is so radical, that has been so loved and hated, that in a way it became really a benchmark for me. You know that love and hated, how a building or a structure can be love and hated. What's your interpretation of that? Is that is that common? It is common. Okay. I, I think that, uh, I mean, there's buildings that have become universal, right? I mean, there's buildings that in some way, uh, uh, and I think it has to do with emotion, you know, not so much with, uh, with uh, how they look like, but what they make us feel, right? And... And for example, in the case of the Pompidou building, uh, a lot of people thought that it was like like the Eiffel Tower in some mm-hmm. way, right? I mean, a new beginning for the city, you know, um, a, an opportunity to build on something new. But there was a conservative wing that that they were astonished by uh, all these pipes and and glass and steel exposed and colors and and there was. I mean, there was a fraction that was extremely upset in in that context. So, so I think it's really possible, and I think the bolder the building is, the the higher the possibility of that is to happen. I like that. The bolder the building is, the, the higher the likelihood that there is a love hate. There's a strong emotion one way or the other. Yeah, I think. and in a certain way. You know, this this occurs often when you're working with clients, right? I always say that uh, sometimes the biggest strength of a design idea is its biggest weakness. 
and 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 you know making clients understand what this is important is a really difficult process and there's a bunch of ideas that are sometimes hidden right in the big picture and and that are actually more problematic right or more challenging from a technical perspective but nobody questions because they don't understand them or they don't see them is the big picture that they see and sometimes a building that is too bold has it becomes controversial right yeah how about your your uh, feelings and thoughts and experiences with color and light and how important they are well i i think color um for me is is connected with material you know, it's not really connected with, uh, it's not something that I add on. I don't believe in this. I, I think that um, color has to be something that is intr- intrinsic to the nature of the materials that you're using to build something, right? Uh, glass can be extremely neutral in color these days because of the technology, right? Uh, or it can be green or it can be blue, right? Uh, or, or many other colors, as a matter of fact, right? Uh, still, you have to coat it, right? I mean, you can leave it as it is, right? And it rusts and it's beautiful, I mean, depending on the application, or you can actually coat it and that would uh, uh, preserve its uh, uh, character, but would give him uh, protection, right? From a technical perspective. So, so in a way, for me, color is really connected with material, right? I mean, it's a, there's a direct connection. I, I like, for example, to use uh, uh, natural materials in, in, in my buildings, you know. I, I, I never, I, I'm not a, a plastics guy, or right? Except if it's a membrane, right? Which is a high performance material that has certain qualities. But uh, even membranes, for example, right? I mean, they, they have a certain texture and and nature that is extremely appealing as they are right and over time they change color and we have to accept that you know in buildings when i when i designed the baseball stadium in mexico um the 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 podiums that basically support this large roof structure uh, were very important for me because it was there was this idea of creating something that looks ancient but it's built with new technology. But still, when you when you look at, at, at them in the from the distance, they look like they've been done with a very precise machine. But when you get close to them, you realize that they're full of imperfections. And because that's the nature of the process of building them. And and the color comes from the rock that we use. And so so all these things are important. Even as you mix concrete with other things, I like to preserve the, the natural aspect of things. You know, I know that in Mexican architecture, color is very different. I don't consider my work uh, aligned with that vision, right? I, I don't understand why something has to be yellow or, or pink or red, and, unless it's decoration, right? I mean, there is a purpose for this, but not in the in the body of the building, in the bones of the building, you know, that, that would be wrong, right? How do you go about your process, Francisco, when uh, a client approaches you with whatever projects project or projects that they're thinking and uh, how do you take what they're telling you and sharing with you and actually form a vision in your own mind if there's a formal process that you have yeah um, you know the 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 process is i I always say that uh for me you know and, and i'm not saying that this is true for others but for me design comes from darkness you know and it's the darkness of of chaos uh, when something is chaotic right in our mind when the beginning of this sort of uh, uh, universe of things that are apparently disconnected and and random and and and, and what are those things well it's it's everything it's the interpretation of what the client wants right the representation of the culture of the place that you're working on. There's a lot of things that are subjective, but there's other things that are really precise, right? The climate, the soil conditions. And so, so, so the beginning is to organize that in my head. Um, and, and that's where I think it comes from darkness because a lot of my process happens really, and actually it's true, happens in the night. You know, I, I think about these things when I have my space, you know, when I am in the office dealing with all these things, right? But when I am alone reflecting on what is important for me in, in translating this 
ambition and vision of a client into something that can be materialized. And what I do is I, I think a lot, you know, it's, it's funny. I don't draw a lot in the beginning. I think a lot and, and I do other things. I, I, I love films, so I do that. I, I play my guitars or I go for runs or whatever that is, you know, and, and I keep thinking. Actually, running is a great thing for me. I, I have solved a lot of design problems and design a lot of buildings when I'm running 10 kilometers. You know, it's enough distance, right? It's, one, it's 50 minutes where you can actually think of these things. So in a way, it's about the organization of, of this. And then once it's really cooked in my head, then I start drawing and, and I have a clear idea of what I want to achieve. Um, in general, I don't do iterations. You know, I go with one bold idea and then from there, we start getting that uh, uh, interaction with the client and the other forces that control design, such as budgets and schedules and things like this. And, 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 and then design really starts to evolve, right? But I think um, the, I always say that uh, when, when a building can be uh, drawn up by a children, by a kid, it's a great building because it has that simplicity. And I think it's much more difficult to be simple, right? And then to do something complicated. And, 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 and this is what I think this process in my head uh, does to my, projects, it, it actually brings them to a place of simplicity because I am constantly depurating my ideas, right? I'm, I'm constantly uh, um, uh, trying to get to the essence of, of, of what it, they're asking me to do and, and what is that I want to do. Fazinating. This is The Modern Architect, KZSU Stanford, 90.1 FM. We're talking today with Francisco Gonzalez Polido, architect and principal of F. GP Atelier. For more information, feel free to visit fgp-atelier.com. Francisco, touch back on a couple of things. One, design comes from darkness. I've not heard that before. And then capturing the essence. Is that from your training, your experience, both? I think I have always been this way. I think I, I always think a lot about what I want to do. And uh, that, incub that process or period of incubation is very important because I think that's what gives the idea a true form. Uh, I don't believe in, in, in different schemes in the beginning of, of this because I think this is more a trial and error as opposed to a, um, a real internalization of all these factors, right? And, and, and I'm bringing them to to a place where they can be realized. And how this connects with the essence of things is because I think that in the process of bringing things to simplicity, all is left is really what it is, right? There's no, there's no fake, there's no posture in this building. It's what it needs to be, right? Um, you, um, in, in that wonderful book, The Little Prince, there's a statement in the beginning where where they talk about when um, that when something cannot be taken away anymore is 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 something extraordinary, right? And and I think this is what I'm looking for. I mean, the, to to make buildings that they get to a point that you cannot eliminate anything. They they are what they need to be. Sustainability is a not just a catchword. Now it's actually a requirement. But if you look back to the the pyramids, you know, hundreds of, hundreds plus years ago, I don't think they were thinking of oh, let's make this sustainable. <laughs> how do how how do you think if you put yourself back in time as a, an architect, even though they may weren't coined that thought to say how can we have this and have it last beyond our lifetime? Well, I mean. I don't think in, in, in all cultures there was that idea, right? I mean, I think the pyramids probably is a great example. There were more connections with uh, cosmos, right, and orientation, but not necessarily because of energy consumption or <laughs> – no. right? It was completely – it was very esoteric, right? And, uh, but th there are other cultures that are very interesting, right? Uh, in the Middle East, for example, uh, 
there is um, uh, Yemen and places like this, you know, um, well, um, it's, it's, uh, um, it, it's the, the, you, you find the beginning of uh, cross ventilation in buildings, for example, mm. or understanding stack effect, right? That you can bring co uh, cool air in the lower portion of the building and then through a, a chimney, a shaft, literally, you know, and through the effect of the wind on top of the shaft, you start driving that air and it helps you to refresh your place, you know, to keep it in better temp to cool your space. And then in addition to that, you know, uh, the, the way they were using water also as a cooling um, element, right? Um, in in uh, Spain, for example, in, this, in southern Spain, in Granada, you, you find in Alhambra uh, those kind of uh, the, 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 that I, those ideas, right, where uh, uh, large uh, pools within courtyards or buildings, they had not only a, a, a social function or a leisure function or aesthetic function, but they also had that function of cooling spaces, the porticos around these buildings. So I think, yeah, I mean, I think if we dig in uh, architecture in some ways, and actually it's interesting, more the vernacular, Right, truly the vernacular architecture. I think it was there was more wisdom there than there is in in churches or monasteries or uh, you know uh, the the government palaces or castles or you know. I, I think it's a vernacular, right? I mean, in Africa, they're hot, and and again in the Middle East, these particular buildings or. Um, in Mexico as well, right? I mean, the way some buildings were designed to to stay cool, you know, in, in a place thermal is so important. So, so I think, it, again, the vernacular has been really important, I think, in, in developing that from the early stages, right? There's a, an extraordinary book from the 70s, Mexican book that is called The Manual of the architect with no shoes, you know? And, and it's incredible because it really goes to, to, that, to those ideas, right? To the very, very uh, origin of sustainability in a time that we're not really thinking that way. They were just trying to solve a problem, but they found technology, right? In their own vernacular way and with the tools they had around to really, uh, uh, start to, to control, right, climate, because that's what it was. It was not about saving energy. It was more about climate control in the sense of providing enough shade, creating enough coolness, or protecting you, right? The igloo is a phenomenal shape in that sense, right? I mean, it's a shape that responds to the non-accumulation of snow, right? And yes. There's all, yes, baby. And, and and, 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 and of course, it's even in an igloo, it's hard to stay warm. But the moment that you have a bonfire inside, then the shape actually helps that, you know, it's like an oven, right? It <laughs> helps that to, the shape is actually appropriate to that function. So I think they were extremely intuitive in those times. And then there was a time, I think in the 80s, where we completely lost that perspective. I think there's architecture in the 70s that is much more extraordinary in that sense, that what happened in the 80s. I think the 80s was a disastrous time in architecture in general. I'm not trying to say there are great buildings from that time, but I think from the point of sustainability, it was a moment of flash, of spending a lot of money to create the wow effect and not really to be responsible to the environment. We, we were not really aware as we are right now of the impact that buildings and cities have in, in, in our urban context, right? In the world, in the planet. Do you think, Francisco, that there is such a thing as laws and principles in architecture and design that are that transcend a moment? Yeah, I mean, I think we go by. Uh, I mean, my work, for example, um, I, I I love modular concepts, right? I mean, I, I love this idea of creating grids in buildings that gives you that give you uh, order and uh, and and a, f a good framework right for things to to happen you know uh, so 
the idea of, yeah, and these are laws, right, that we follow as architects, and there's different laws, right? There is a, the, uh, the uh, concepts of symmetry, right, or asymmetry, as a matter of fact, right? There's uh, a, an idea of balance and harmony, and these are laws, right, that we go by. How we interpret these things and how we apply them to buildings is, is very different, and I think this makes architecture very exciting, right? And order really comes from there, right? I mean, it's, it's a way that you can go back and explain what you did and why you did it, right? I mean, architecture at the end is, as much as it is an art, it's a science tool. And, and sometimes when someone says, and what this is for, you need to have an answer. You cannot just say, well, because I like it, right? I mean, that's not an answer. There's got to be a reason behind this, right? And... and uh, or to make the building be likable, right? I mean, I, I just don't respect this approach, you know? I think things, when things work, they're absolutely gorgeous, beautiful, and not necessarily beautiful things are actually functional. This is the Modern Architect podcast. We're talking today with Francisco G. Polido, architect and principal of FGP Atelier. Francisco, we talked before, I think it's Poder that you... Uh, Talked as a, an acknowledgement. Share with us a, a bit about it and uh, you know why they matter to you. Yeah, you know, Poder is a very important project for me because what the word means in Spanish is power, but it really what the, the mission of this organization is empowerment, right? They they actually they support immigrants that uh, come to this country in very difficult conditions uh, with very little tools, right? I mean. What I mean by that is that um, little training, they don't even know how to fill out a form, how to get a, a, a license. Uh, they don't speak the language, you know? So this organization really, it's, a, it's, it's a, almost like a community center in that sense, right? That embraces people from uh, all kinds of origins, right? Um, that they come to this country looking for an opportunity and they provide them with tools to 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 start a life here, right? Of meaning and be productive. Uh, the the building is interesting because it was a, a, a power station that was not in operation for decades, and the the chairman of the organization bought it for one dollar with the condition of a full renovation. So the city basically gave him the land and the building. And he had to commit, right, to, to an intervention of the building. What we did is that we preserved the building because I'm a big believer in adaptive reuse. I think this is actually one of the things that we forget in the context of sustainability that is very important, right? I mean, we keep building things that we don't need and demolishing things that are extraordinary, right? Instead of trying to ad adapt those things that we have and give them a, a new future, right? And um, so in that sense, uh, I, I, uh, I respected the building, you know, but also we added elements that we think are important to not only to increase the building area, right, but to create also a different impression because this building is in a very difficult neighborhood, right? It's, it's, a, it's a neighborhood that is not... Uh, very safe, you know, that is not very, uh, uh, it has very many challenges. So the idea of creating a, a plaza that what is for everyone, uh, adding a glass pavilion that gives these children an opportunity to see something different that inspires them, that is not the same building that they've been seeing for decades, right? Uh, or, or for the years, right, in the case of children. I, I am a firm believer that when you actually intervene something in, 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 in a place like this, right, where there's almost no inspiration, every house is the same and things are falling apart and there's just no, this idea of uh, pushing, not pushing the envelope, but really uh, helping society, right, to uh, th th that, that immediate group, right, to think different about space and architecture and that there's other possibilities. It's almost like the building becomes an educational tool. Um, 
believe it or not, uh, some of these kids, and I know, you know, we have talked to people in the community, they have never been in, in Chicago downtown. They think that this is a, yeah, and, and they're 15 minutes away. They don't have the means, right, to get on a, on a bus, and, and they think that this is a place that they don't belong. So architecture has that power, right, of, of integrating and, and inspiring and educating, and that's why this building is so important for me. I want to go back to uh, a building evoking emotion and talk a bit, a bit about your uh, your buildings and your work. You share with us a bit about, which is very unique, is a, an architect on a Forbes magazine cover. Share with us that, what that means to you, uh, and what do you think it means to, for architecture as well? Look, I, I, have to, uh, uh, I have to tell you that this... This means a lot, but not because where I am or, or, or it means a lot because the group that is those hundred people are people that are actually uh, changing something, uh, that they're influencing things, right? I mean, basically the cover, well, the, 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 the statement, right, is a uh, hundred most creative architects in the world, right? So obviously, I mean, being a socialist is an honor and it's a privilege, but it's also a big responsibility because you need to continue doing what you're doing, right? In order to stay there. It's like mm -hmm. a good song. You cannot be a one hit wonder, right? You have to continue uh, your journey, right? With the same principles and dedication and commitment to, to be there, right? So, so in a way it represents a lot to me. Yes, of course, it's a, it's a recognition to my work, to my efforts. But at, at the same time, uh, it's very inspiring because of the eclecticism of the group, the, the prominence of some of these figures. I'm not counting myself there, you know, <laughs> and I'm, I'm still building a lot of things, but there are filmmakers, there are actors, there are very, very accomplished musicians or very accomplished, uh, dancers. And, and, uh, uh, it's a good mixture, I think, between be, between disciplines uh, or among disciplines, right? So, so yeah, I mean, it's 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 a phenomenal. Uh, uh, I think uh, it was a phenomenal end of the year, <laughs> in that sense. Yeah, in that sense. Yeah, it was great, great, great to see that. And also, your book. Share with us a bit about your yeah. book. Yeah, you know, the, the book is something that I, I started really writing the day that the pandemic was officially announced in the United States. And I, I had been planning this book for some time, but there was really never the right time, right? You're always too busy. You always have an excuse, right? Not to sit and, and write something. <laughs> and, and I said, this is the perfect time. We're going to get into this moment and, and we don't know how much is going to last, right? I mean... We were optimistic in the beginning, and as we were progressing, we knew that this was going to last much longer. And so I started writing this book in a very interesting way because there was a guy in my office that was preparing some questions for me. And, and we were having these kind of conversations on topics that are important for me. And so the book started almost backwards, right? I, I started with essays, which is kind of at the end of each subsection of the book because these are topics that interest me. And it was really reflections on um, sustainability, on housing, on urbanism, uh, on technology, right? There were reflections. And then at some point I thought, this is interesting. Let's really write essays that are not, not connected with my practice, but they're really reflections of my philosophy, what I like to see, what I don't like uh, about the, the, the status quo. And, and then from there, I, I selected projects that were connected with these concepts, my projects, obviously. And this is why the book is interesting in, in its format, because it's not a monograph of buildings. You know, it's not a collection of buildings. I didn't want to do this. There's too many of those. So I took this. I found 17 projects that had a connection with these topics. And it was very genuine. There was a real connection. So then... And of course, the beautiful thing is that there were built projects and unbuilt projects. And I think this is so important because a built project brings a certain a, a building, which is a consequence of many forces. And a, an unbuilt project is more pure. It's 
perhaps only the force of the architect and the client. There's not all these construction issues or, and all these things, right? Schedules and budgets and things that are actually start kind of bringing architecture to a box, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this was important too. And then while I was there, of course, that part, it was very interesting because it was, it has descriptions of the buildings, you know, very sort of traditional in the way architects describe their work, but also has personal statements for me of emotional, you know, what is really, what does this mean for me? And it's not so much about the building. It's again about concepts, but it, it's not like an essay that is speculative. This is really connected with what this means or meant for me. And then from there, I organized the book in three sections, which is values, network, and ambition, right? And this is really the beginning. I, I tell you, the book is really, first you read what it means for me, the chapter of values, and then you see the buildings, and then you get to the essay. And then again, you know, and then there's all these sub, the other essays within that section. So the, the idea of, of dividing the book in, in, in these three aspects, you know, values, network, and ambition is because I think, you know, when you talk about the the aesthetic of sustainability, uh, I don't think sustainability is, is uh, this is an ethical problem. It's not a technical problem. And this is ethical, right? I mean, we need to think this way. We care about this planet. Uh, I was talking about, I talk about how, for example, uh, there's little really discussion in, in, um, in, in the uh, associations where architects belong about defending the rights of architects, right? I mean, developers are going crazy what they're asking us, you know, to do, n not in the context of design, but the conditions of the competitions, the, the legal aspect of things, contractually things are extremely one-sided and there's no one really out there saying wait this has to stop right i mean you cannot compromise so much there's another ethical thing another ethical thing for me is budgets right i mean architects you must commit to a budget the airport that we design in mexico is going to be on budget and, and on time uh, is it going to be what i design unfortunately i don't know because I, I i was not hired to do the construction administration and i've seen changes that worry me but but there's a an ethical uh, uh, aspect, you know, of meeting those goals, budget and schedule. And, and I think architects tend to ignore that this is important. And they're always optimistic that, no, you know, we're going to figure it out and the client is going to bring more money and whatever, whatever. And it's not this way. So, so this is sort of the aspect of values. And then network, network, networks are everywhere, right? I mean, media is pervasive, is everywhere. You know, I mean, there's this idea of, of, uh, networks as well as infrastructure you know how a bridge can be more than a bridge and can can become a park how you know this is and and then there's also the network as collaborations you know your consultants your team architects tend to talk too much about what they do and the, and, and it's, it's a perception that oh this is a Okay, I'm not going to use an example of somebody else. This is a building by Francisco. It's never this way. I mean, it's, the buildings are the, the result of very intensive collaborations that are very meaningful in the process of creating this work. And, and then there's the, the, final, the final aspect, which is really ambition. And, I, and, and ambition, it, it, it goes to very large projects, but also to very small projects. Because I am convinced that it's not the scale of things what makes something extraordinary. It's the scale of the ambition. And that really connects all these projects, not only the ambition of the architect, but the ambition of the city, the ambition of the developer, even the ambition of the team that is supporting you to design this thing. Because you want a committed uh, team of engineers, right, that embrace your ambition. And instead of being obstructive to the process, they bring fresh ideas to realize this into something meaningful. So at the end, ambition is a very important aspect for me. And then finally, you know, at the end of the book, I have a section on collaboration that is extremely candid. You know, I was, when I read it many times before the book was published, I was concerned that maybe it was way too candid. You know, I am, <laughs> I am a very open person. And, but I think it, it's an, a good narrative of not the result, but the process what we go through to get this this work of architecture done realized what is the influence of our clients of all these forces but more as telling a story right the stories and examples and anecdotes 
And then in the beginning of the book, there is a, 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 an introduction by Mark Lamster, which is the architectural critic of, of the, the Dallas, uh, uh, I think, Times, I believe. And, and he basically, uh, you know, he, he writes, it's very, it's, I like it because we actually develop a, a relationship, you know, uh, um, in, in one project, in Veer Towers, in Las Vegas. Uh, he, so it's a very personal introduction, you know, about uh, how we met, how we understand my work. And, and it's interesting because he makes reference to uh, Bookie Fuller, Book Mr. Fuller, you know, um, uh, as a spaceship Earth, you know, he thinks that, that my work has that quality, right, of, of very technological, looking to solve big problems, even in a small scale. So this is really the essence of it. It has 600 pages. It was published by Hadje Kanz in Berlin. It was a phenomenal collaboration. The paper came from Vienna. The, the lithography was done in France of the pictures and of the, of, the, of the images. You know, there's photographs and of course there's diagrams, uh, the diagrams in Hamburg. And I mean, it was an incredible collaboration of, of uh, mostly uh, European countries. Well, European countries. It was printed in Latvia. Uh, the cover came from France. I mean, it was amazing. So in I'm very proud of the result. And the reason why it's called progression is because uh, I believe that, that every time that I do a building, I learn something and we innovate. And in, in baby steps, one day, we actually change something important. It's not, I don't believe that innovation is something that happens overnight. It's something that gradually occurs in architecture, at least. And I think in other fields, it's true. And so, so this progression... In a way, because of my connection with music, my love for music, and the way I understand music, you know, progression is how you move from mm -hmm. one harmony to the other, or from, you know, one note to the other. And this is a progression in music. In architecture, in some way, I was thinking about this metaphor on how the work really travels, right, through time. And, and in every building, something is add-on that at the end of, of a period of time, that last building, in a certain way, is the offspring of many other buildings because there's things that you learn in the process and the building is more sophisticated, more simple, much more advanced. And, so, so, and that's, that's the reason for the time. Outstanding. Francisco, it's been a real, it's, it's always a, a real honor and pleasure having you as a guest and always talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to The Modern Architect. I'm Tom Dioro. Our guest today has been Francisco Gonzalez Polido, architect and principal of FGP Atelier. Francisco is a renowned architect noted for his expressive yet rational design approach. For more information, feel free to visit fgp-atelier.com. Join us again next time when we welcome another outstanding architect, engineer, influencer, or civic leader committed to positive, sustainable and beautiful cities, communities, and lives. Today's episode is underwritten by Modeler, the community for AEC professionals to find and share design inspiration created and maintained by architects. Feel free to join the hundreds of thousands of other AEC professionals at modeler.com forward slash modern architect. <laughs>